Thanks for watching TechWiki. Click the subscribe button, then enable notifications with the bell icon so you won't miss any future videos. These days, just adding a CPU, a stick of RAM, a storage device, and a power supply to a mini ITX motherboard will give you a small and fully functional computer in a matter of minutes. And this is possible because of how many different functions the average motherboard combines into one little slab of like fiberglass, metal, and silicon. But it wasn't always like this. In fact, early electronics didn't have anything resembling the lovely green boards with black integrated circuits that we're used to today. Instead, it was common to see individual full-sized wires linking every capacitor, resistor, and other component necessary to make up a full computer system. Unsurprisingly, this approach took up tons of space, added a bunch of weight, and was relatively fragile, meaning that the printed circuit board took off in popularity pretty quickly, starting in the 1950s. It should be noted, however, that these early PCBs were still a far cry from the RGB motherboard that you might have sitting in your computer right now. While back then, a simple device like a radio might have gotten away with using just one PCB, full-fledged computers needed many circuit boards to handle different functions connected by a backplane that you might consider to be a forerunner of the modern motherboard. Unlike true motherboards, though, these backplanes tended to be dumb connections with no actual logic that consisted of little more than a bunch of slots lined up in a row so that other expansion cards could be plugged in. For example, the Altair 8800 used one slot to insert a processor, another for memory, and so on. It wasn't until 1981 that we got a big upgrade. The planar board in the original IBM PC featured an Intel 8088 CPU, built-in memory, and actual external I.O. So it was far more than just a glorified bundle of wires like smushed together. All you could connect directly to it was a keyboard and a cassette drive, but it also included a handful of expansion slots that didn't look too different from what we're used to today. And those slots were important because motherboards were still so simple that they didn't have features that we consider basic now, like drive headers, for example. So if you wanted to load up your copy of Flight Simulator 1.0, you would need a standalone disk interface card. And we didn't see modern memory modules that fit into RAM slots until the mid-1980s either. By the late 80s, though, engineers had fully embraced the goal of integrating more and more functions onto the motherboard. And so little ICs called Super I.O. chips were becoming more common. These functioned like rudimentary versions of a modern chipset. They provided drive controllers, ports for printers, mice, keyboards, and other devices, and the system's BIOS. Now, that all doesn't sound like a huge deal today, but Super I.O. chips took up less space and they were much more cost-effective than expansion cards, setting the stage for full-featured modern motherboards. Around the same time, in 1987 specifically, we got the first ever integrated VGA graphics chips when IBM released Model 50 of their almost famous Personal System 2. Unlike modern integrated GPUs though, this was a chip that was affixed to the motherboard instead of being built into the CPU itself. A paradigm that we saw again starting in the mid-1990s as 3D GPUs like the S3 Trio and the ATI Rage series appeared on motherboards, obviating the need for a separate card for basic use. Though, GPUs that were soldered onto motherboards began to disappear in favor of ones built into CPUs by the mid-2010s. Speaking of CPUs, let's jump back again to 1989, when the first CPU socket with a vaguely modern look, Socket 1, appeared alongside Intel's wildly popular 486 processor. While earlier designs involved soldering the CPU directly to the board or significant force on the part of the user to insert or remove them, Socket 1 had a simple mechanism based around a pin grid array, very similar to modern AMD sockets, though with a mere 169 pins. But it wasn't just CPU sockets that were getting a facelift. Expansion slots were also changing at that time. And it was about time, as the ancient ISA standard had been used since the days of the original IBM PC. 
1994, PCI started becoming popular in consumer PCs, followed by the short-lived AGP for graphics cards in 1997 and PCI Express, which is still with us today, in 2004. But what about onboard networking and audio? Well, in the mid-1980s, there were a number of proprietary networking protocols, but since the now-familiar Ethernet was a relatively simple standard with easy physical construction, it became the go-to for networking in the late 80s, and, again, its simplicity meant that it quickly spread to PC motherboards in the early 1990s. And although sound cards also started appearing on the market in the late 80s and early 90s, and we had little internal speakers that could emit bleeps and bloops for a while, we didn't see true, fully functional onboard digital sound hit the mainstream until 1999, when Intel included the AC97 standard in its 810 chipset, which, incidentally, was also the first Intel chipset to include integrated graphics, meaning it was no longer necessary to have a separate chip for video processing, be it on the motherboard or on an adapter card. So now that all of these innovations had a clear home on the PC motherboard, the stage was set for refinements made possible by decreasing costs and the continued miniaturization of components. Not to mention an increase in processing capacity to handle lots of different features. Meaning that these days, even small form factor motherboards feature RGB headers, premium power delivery, and Wi-Fi. And of course, by the early 2010s, manufacturers also realized that all those bells and whistles are meaningless without some vaguely threatening heat sinks to show all comers that you mean business. Speaking of meaning business, do you mean business when it comes to keeping prying eyes away from your online activity? Then check out Private Internet Access VPN. Not only does PIA work on up to five devices at once, hiding your true IP address, it allows you to bypass geo restrictions and censorship by making you appear as though you are connecting from somewhere else. And it's got all kinds of other great functionality too. It blocks unwanted connections to help prevent attacks. It auto blocks all traffic if the VPN disconnects. It keeps your data out of the hands of advertisers and other snoops who are tracking your activity. It prevents DNS leaks and even includes MACE, PIA's built-in malware blocker. It supports multiple VPN protocols and they've got apps for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, Linux, and even a Chrome extension with support for more platforms coming soon. PIA has over 3,000 servers in 28 countries and doesn't log user activity. So what are you waiting for? Check them out today at the link below. So thanks for watching, guys. You can dislike, like, you can check out our other channels, you can leave a comment if you have a suggestion for a feature fast as possible, and you can subscribe so you don't miss any videos here on TechWiki. It's over there, over there. I don't know where the button is.